we took a look at the life of the former Muslim leader through the eyes of his daughter. Here now is an excerpt from that program. Malcolm Little, Detroit Red, Malcolm X. Three names, one person, shaped by his father, Earl. But Earl Little was at times an abusive father and sometimes wife beater. A part-time preacher and Marcus Garvey organizer, Earl Little saw four of his six brothers die of violence, three killed by white men. He, too, would be murdered by, though never proved, the Black Legion, Michigan's answer to the Ku Klux Klan because of his back-to-Africa activities. Eight children, a destitute mother, Louise Little, on the public dole, her pride crumbled. She was institutionalized, and her children became wards of the court, foster kids. Malcolm, a petty thief, graduated to bigger things as Detroit Red. He became a numbers runner, a hustler, a drug dealer, a burglar. And at 20, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and served a seven-year term. Malcolm was introduced to Islam by his brothers and sisters, and he closed the book on the past. The reasons were uh, very clear at the time. It was the only thing for a black man in prison who seemed like there was nothing else for him to hold on to. The Nation of Islam seemed to offer at the time an alternative to succumbing to what the, the world around my father was offering people of color, oppression, um, low self-esteem, no real place in America. And um, through information that I've learned, people sharing information with me, some of the things that they brought to the prison, books, data, uh, conversations, persons that were involved in the nation, seemed as if there was a clear direction for a black man, gave some promise for a black man. And I think it's one of the things that the Nation of Islam was very successful in doing, rehabilitating or offering hope to um, black persons who didn't feel they had a direction or a place or a voice in this country. Our religion teaches us to be intelligent, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, send them to the cemetery. <laughs> Malcolm X's rise through the ranks of the Nation of Islam was meteoric. He terrified whites, confused and disturbed them, was abhorred and despised. Malcolm ruthlessly attacked integrationists as Uncle Tom Negroes. He was to many the hate master, the devil incarnate. Elijah Muhammad, the messenger of the Nation of Islam, was zealously defended by his incendiary spokesman. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that the only solution for the problem is that our people, of which there are now 22 million, be uh, involved in a mass exodus back to our own homeland. But this is a long-range program. And, and while we are uh, orienting our mind toward going back in the direction of Africa, we have to live right here. In demand, besieged, and considered dangerous, Malcolm X found in his wife, Betty, a disposition, an attitude, and a trust. An educated woman, Betty was the personification of the Muslim wife, supportive, loyal, and the mother of his six children. The eldest daughter, Attila, was very young when she witnessed her father being gunned down by three men at the Audubon Ballroom in Upper Manhattan. The assassination followed the rupture with Elijah Muhammad over Muhammad's alleged adultery, Malcolm's popularity, and his attempts to build a new organization aimed at embracing all people. I remember the tension prior to, and the, there was an uh, awkwardness in the air. I understand that he was supposed to come out earlier in the program, but was reluctant. There was some hesitancy in the order of persons to speak. And when people talk about children picking up on things, and I look back and recall in retrospect some of the anxiety I felt even prior to the event taking place, it confirms for me that messages are sent to you in the air, even if you are too young to convey them. We were staying in Corona with some close friends after our house was bombed. And I remember receiving, my mother receiving a call requesting from my father that we all come down. I felt uneasy from that point. No explained reason, so it wasn't anything I, can, I could say to my mother. Yet, on the other hand, we were excitedly 
going down to the Audubon Ballroom. All I can say in short is our life as a family changed drastic, drastically. I remember sitting on a woman's lap and crying in response to everyone else crying and suddenly feeling too old to be sitting on someone's lap, that I had some role. Perhaps it was seeing my mother so vulnerable, seeing my father down, obviously dead. And I think just protective of your parents. I don't, I don't know if parents are aware of how in tune to them their children are and how somehow or another in your small way you want to offer some kind of refuge. The charming thing about my father, as he was such a strong man to the general public, he was, in, he was so to me, but he was very frolicky. You know, he was fun, he was great for kids. And uh, exceedingly sensitive, uh, again, in terms of role models or images of man and woman. As my father was certainly the king of my household, if he was in pain or vulnerable about something, it wasn't unmasculine to cry. Now, you may be shocked by these words, but I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, and prayed to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were blue, whose hair was blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. And we were all brothers, truly. People of all colors and races believing in one God and one humanity. And coming up on today's program, interviews with director Spike Lee, actors Denzel Washington and Al Freeman Jr., plus Malcolm's widow, Dr. Betty Shabazz, and oldest daughter, Atala. All that and more when we return. He has established himself as one of America's most important filmmakers. In 1986, he made his film debut with an independently produced comedy called She's Gotta Have It. That film set him at the forefront of the black new wave in American cinema. Lee's second feature was School Days, and in 1989, his Do the Right Thing won him an Academy Award nomination for Best Original Screenplay and Best Director Award from the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. In 1990, his Mo Better Blues, starring Denzel Washington, was critically well-received. It was the first time Denzel and Lee worked together on a film and probably made their second encounter on Malcolm less stringent. And then in the very next year, 1991, Lee's Jungle Fever, starring Wesley Snipes, was released and was once again favorably received by the critics and fans alike. And in a recent interview with Spike Lee, we talked with him about the movie Malcolm X and what it was that inspired him to bring it to the silver screen. I read the book in junior high school. It's really the most important book I've ever read. So Malcolm has been with me since then. And uh, back then, I didn't know I wanted to be a filmmaker. But uh, I just applied that to everything else I was doing. And uh, everything is timing. And this is the right time for the movie. Now, I understand that there was a, uh, another director that was set to do this movie, and you went to Warner Brothers and say, I have to do this movie. Norman Jewison was the director, mm -hmm. and I campaigned for the part, for the role, for the job actively, and uh, they had the good sense to say maybe uh, we should get this guy a shot. I might point out that, uh, that uh, he was also a white director. And yes. You figured that... Uh, that you needed to do this because of your ethnic, uh, ethnicity. So well, that was a that was a plus, but also the fact that I'm filming a very good filmmaker. But the fact right. that you know, though I'm black, and just and I know what it means to be a black male in this country, and, and that's something I, that a white director is never going to know. They might think they know, but they're not going to know it. And you need that for it. I, I thought you needed that for this film. So, Spike, when you became interested in uh, and filmmaking, of course, you went to school. You got the, you got your tools together. You got everything straight, and then you started making the movies. Uh, go through them very briefly. Uh, yeah. Tell us something about those early days. Well, I went to Morehouse undergrad, graduated '79. I wanted to further my craft, knowledge of the craft of filmmaking. Came home to go to NYU. Did the film. My thesis film was called Joe's Best Side Barbershop. We cut heads, and won a Studio Academy Award. 
I was 82. It took me another four years to get a feature film off the ground. Now it's 1986. She's got to have it. School days, 88. Do the right thing, 89. Mo Better Blues, 90. Jungle Fever, 91. And now we're up to Malcolm X, 92. So that's six films in the last seven years. Now, and during that, that whole while, probably unbeknownst to you, you were working up to the Malcolm X film. Yes, that's an interesting thing now. Now I can look back and see that everything I've done was in preparation for Malcolm X. But at the time, I, not, I could not know that. A ton of work. Listen to Malcolm's speeches on tape. View newsreel footage. His stuff on videotape. Speak hundreds of hours. Record on tape. Malcolm's relatives, his associates, friends. Go through periodicals. Newspapers, you know, you had to do the great research on the, on the production design, the costumes, the music, all that stuff. And talking to the people, they all said, you know, yeah, how, how such a, a great, he had a great sense of humor, Malcolm. But for me, the most important thing I got, the thing that was really liberating, I would ask people about Malcolm. Everybody would have a different take of Malcolm. So for me, that, that was just a breath of fresh air because it just showed me I, I cannot get these people to agree on one thing about Malcolm, so therefore, you, know, you just have to go ahead and go with your vision. You did something else that was unusual that probably no other filmmaker has ever done, and that is you went to Mecca. Well, I didn't go to Mecca, I mean, but you we know, were able to get cameras, got a cameras into That's Mecca. never been done before. Never, ever, ever, ever. We shot in Mecca. I mean, we're the... The Saudi government has never allowed people into the holy city of Mecca to shoot during Hajj. Not just Hajj, period. But they they grant us that. They grant us permission on this film. Because of what they what they felt about Malcolm. Each hour here in this sacred land enables me to have a greater spiritual insight into what is happening in America. The American Negro can never be blamed for his racial animosity. He's only reacting to 400 years of oppression and discrimination. But as racism leads America up the suicidal path, I do believe that the younger generation will see the handwriting on the wall, and many of them will want to turn to the spiritual path of the truth. The only way left in this world to ward off the disaster that racism must surely lead to. Now. And in, uh, in, in putting this together, I know about the beginning, there's the burning of the flag, there was the beating of Rodney King, uh, and then, of course, we get into the earlier days. But some are saying, I mean, uh, the people who watch this and say, well, what does this mean? He's burning the flag, and, and that's disrespectful, and uh, why is he using Rodney King being whipped? What does that all mean, and what kind of movie maker is this? And how's it going to affect the, 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 the Americans, period, you know, especially the... The Caucasian Americans, how are they going to view this? Audiences, black and white, are going to get it. They're going to get it on this one. There's no doubt in my mind. The message, who he was, how relevant he is, how we could tie in what he said back then to what is happening today, why Spike used the Roddy King footage in a historical piece, all that stuff. The audiences will get it. Have you had any response from the, uh, the black Muslim community on this? No, they have not seen the film yet either, but uh, I expect to hear from Minister, Mr. Minister Farrakhan very soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think his reaction is going to be? Well, then there might be a couple of things in this film he might not be happy about. Uh -huh. uh, how would you answer those who said, don't mess up Malcolm? Don't mess up Malcolm. While we were making the film? While you were making the film. Now that it's done, how do you feel about it? Wow, we didn't mess up Malcolm. Now, do you feel that the African-American, the young African-Americans, uh, I know you've called for them to stay out of school if necessary to come and see this film on the day that it opens. Do you still feel that way? Yes, but that's not exactly what I said. What I said was I wanted parents to take their children, children out of it. school and go as family to see the film. I still feel that. And... When I said that statement, people came up to me in the streets and said, Spike, I was taking a day off anyway before you even said that. 
when I was taking my ch my child out of school. And I'm still calling for that. November 18th, Wednesday. Show up. What about the commercialization of Malcolm? How do you feel about that? Some say that it takes away from the legacy of the man himself. Well, I can agree with that. But I think that, you know, it really comes down to Betty Shabazz now because... She's the president of Malcolm's estate. She's the one that has, has, has yes and no on the licenses. And it comes down to good taste. Mm -hmm. I, myself, in my opinion, I can see a hat or a T-shirt. I can't see Malcolm X potato chips. You know, I think that's going too far, in now, my opinion. Right. Now, people who view this movie, what is it that you would like for them to walk away with? The main thing the main thing well how people could really turn their lives around maybe how you can't lift yourself up and make a change what's your name Malcolm Little no that's the name of the slave masters who own your family you don't even know who you are who are you before there was any such thing as a Republican or a Democrat we were black before there was any such thing as a mason or an elk, we were black. Yeah, that's right. Before there was any such thing as a Jew or a Christian, we were black people. Right. In fact, before there was any such place as America, we were black. Right. And after America has long passed from the scene, there will still be black people. I'm going to tell you like it really is. Every election year, these politicians are sent up here to pacify. Right. They're sent here and set up here by the white men. This is what they do. They send drugs in Harlem down here to pacify us. They send alcohol down here to pacify us. They send prostitution down here to pacify us. Why, you can't even get drugs in Harlem without the white man's permission. You can't get prostitution in Harlem without the white man's permission. You can't get gambling in Harlem without the white man's permission. Every time you break the seal on that liquor bottle, that's a government seal you're breaking. Oh, I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. Bamboozled. Let us stray. Shabazz and oldest daughter, Adela, were both intricately involved in the making of the film. Adela's character appears in the film as a young girl, and Betty is portrayed by actress Angela Bassett. Recently, I spoke with both of them about Malcolm and their impressions of the film was a very uh, complex uh, person and that he certainly had a lot of life experiences and uh, it is kind of uh, impossible uh, to have all of them I think the selection that um, people will see in the three hours and 15 minutes or three hours and 21 minutes um, perhaps is um, an appropriate selection Mm -hmm. And the person who portrays you in the movie, Miss Bassett, mm -hmm. you think of her performance? Uh, pretty good performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you feel that, uh, that the commercialization of Malcolm is taking away from his legacy? Nobody really was concerned about, uh, you mean all of the memorabilia? Yes. No, no, it's not taken away, but... But nobody was really concerned about it until January, until I hired somebody, because the proliferation was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that um, that uh, I got a lawyer and a, and a group to handle it, because what I discovered was that people that I saw and talked to frequently had uh, taken possession of Malcolm and had given license to other people. One other question, and that is the question of uh, children or students uh, staying out of school to go and see this film. Malcolm used to laugh when he dealt with highly sensitive issues. Do, do, do you know, maybe people need a softer approach. Maybe you can't look serious and say, uh, stay, out of, stay, stay out of school and see this movie, you know. I think that he put a lot of time in the film. He was, um, uh, became very attached to the subject um, and probably wanted to share his admiration, appreciation, and glory for the subject and, and wanted everybody to, listen, stay out of school and see it, you know.
and I would say stay out of church and see it or stay out of wherever and see it. Oh, let's talk about you for a change. Mm. How tall are you? Mm. What do you ask? Idle question. Oh, well, if it's just an idle question, I hope you won't force me to answer it. <laughs> no, I won't force you. <laughs> Brother Bain says that I'm tall enough for a tall man. He's briefed you also. <laughs> How old are you, sister? You know, Brother Malcolm, there are a few things about women that you don't understand. Some of us were quite possessive, very vain. Are you? And persistent when we've set our mind to something. What have you set your mind to? Being a good Muslim. A good nurse and a good wife. Have finally, after 20 years of trying to pull this piece together, have come up with a piece that indeed um, offers uh, clarity in the transitions of my father's lives, especially the religious and political side, or specifically the religious and political um, directions that he had uh, chosen. And I hope that when youngsters specifically leave, that they now have a, a broader palette of who this, who this man was, that they have more information in making their judgment so that when they call themselves appreciators, they know indeed what they're appreciating. Mm -hmm. If they're not for him, I don't think it's necessary for you to agree with Malcolm, but at least know enough to know what you're not agreeing with. Uh, some have talked about the com commercialization of X. Uh, and that it takes away from the man, the legacy itself. How do, how do you view that? It all depends on what you knew of the man from the beginning. If you knew the man, it takes nothing away from who he is. For those who knew nothing, it might be the bit that moves them for further or closer to the understanding. Young people will um, follow trend and fashion. And if that's what it takes to ignite their interest, then so be it. I am glad then that there is a film that is out right now so that they can now have an answer for the reason why they purchased their attire. The uh, people that, who, that will be viewing this movie, if there's one thing that you'd like for them to take away f when they leave the movie, when they walk out on this, watching this film, what is it you'd like for them to take with them? Number one, that we're all entitled to life development, trial and error, growing, changing, questing and that we must enable ourselves the opportunity to be fairer to the people around us. As we have been victims, you have to recognize and be sensitive to victims of the world. Hence, we have to learn about that and not um, learn about ourselves selfishly, but inclusive in the world picture so that when someone else determines for you how much you should learn or not, you recognize it in the deficit. When the Negro, the so-called Negro in America, gets on God's side and listens to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he'll want to get off of drugs. He'll want to get away from a life of crime. He'll want to get away from committing adultery and fornication. Then he would want to get off the welfare. He would want to get a job. He would want to earn a living and take care of his family, and his family would respect him. His son will say, I'm proud that that's my father. His wife will say, I'm proud that that's my husband. Father only means that you're taking care of your children. That's what it is to be a father. Father doesn't mean that you're having some babies. Anybody can have a baby. Having a baby does not make you a father. Anybody can go out and get a woman, but not anybody can take care of that woman. There's another word for it. It's called responsibility. Around for filmmaker Spike Lee and Academy Award-winning actor Denzel Washington. Washington played a jazz musician in Spike Lee's Mo Better Blues. Playing Malcolm X is not new for Denzel. He played Malcolm on stage in the play When the Chickens Came Home to Roost. However, Denzel continues to say that he can never be Malcolm, but he stresses that the key is to capture his spirit. And veteran actor Al Freeman Jr., who plays the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the movie, was nominated for an Emmy in 1979 for playing Malcolm X in Roots 2. And we spoke with both actors about their roles and the impact it's made on their lives. Elijah certainly had a voice that was very different than mine. Uh, he had uh, an education that was a little different than mine, and he had a way of putting ideas together that was very different. Uh, uh, so 
that, those things I consider to be external things, you know. After a while, he began to get down to clearly what he really was, which is a human being and a person, and, uh, and think of it, uh, when you're that kind of a figure uh, of stature to a lot of people, that you wake up and, and everything that comes out of your mouth has to be something of a profound statement. Otherwise, people will be very disappointed. They don't want you to be a human being. They want you to be this figure that they revere, that they feel really very close to, but really not. They want you to tell them things. So that has to happen constantly for every minute, every second. So that has to isolate the man a little bit. So as a human being, I'm sure at certain times that he felt a little bit uh, alone, maybe, or a little lonely. So that I think he accepted his position. But uh, what did he feel about that kind of uh, elevation? And who did he confide in? Uh, certainly Malcolm in the early stages, they were very close, you know, father-son sort of a thing. Um, how did you feel about, uh, did you feel a special responsibility for this role? And did you, did you study Elijah Muhammad? Did you, did, I mean, how did you prepare for this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is our technological age where you have the, the tapes of people as they were in that period, saying the things that they say, doing the things they do. Uh, you make use of all that, certainly. Well, then you have to look a little beyond, as, as we were just discussing, you know, that uh, what was happening to the inner man, you know, and once I sort of considered the fact of, of just the difficulty of, of what we're doing now where I'm trying to find a way to express myself and hoping that I make some kind of sense. I mean, certainly Elijah had to find a way constantly, uh, hour by hour, day by day, to say things to people uh, that was commensurate with the stature that they had given him, you know. But he was a man, certainly. And, uh, when you when you were coming up, of course, um, you were you know you were during that era, Malcolm, yeah. Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. Did this ever occur to you that one day that this would be a movie, and uh, maybe you know if it was that you'd like to have a part, you'd like to play a part in? Uh, uh, no idea. No, no, that, no that never, not in your wildest dream. Occurred. Would you think that this? No, would no, no, no. It, it never occurred that would happen. <laughs> and and now that it has happened, uh, the movie is complete. And uh, it looks as if it's going to be uh, a big success. Mm. What are your inner feelings about what your contribution to this, this effort? Well, I really hope that what people will find there is, is the essence of the man, um, some of his, his vision, some of his commitment to his vision, uh, maybe even some of his frailty, which makes him human, which also, in my view, makes him uh, even more important. What would be the uh, one thing that you'd want people to walk away from this movie feeling? What would you like for them to carry away from this movie? I think really uh, during the course of the film you see how Malcolm used what he learned about the world. Once he got a clear handle on what he wanted to be and what he wanted to do with his life and how he allowed uh, what he learned and facts and his observations uh, to change uh, according to what he experienced so that his view became global you know and he was toward a universal and I think genuinely a, a man committed to helping to giving to making something better to helping people define themselves I shall introduce you as my national minister. It will be a difficult task. Your assignment is to build temples all over this nation. More work than you've ever done in your life. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You will be in the public eye. Beware of them cameras. Oh, the cameras are bad as any narcotic. Yeah. White devil will be watching your every step. And yeah. your own brothers will be jealous, hostile, go slowly. Yes, sir. 
I understand you played the role of Malcolm on the stage when you were first performing. How did you find playing him years later on the screen? Well, I'm, I'm a lot older, a little wiser, uh, hopefully more experienced, definitely more humble. And uh, I try to bring those aspects to the character. Uh, I'm closer to the age of Malcolm X. Uh, and I, this, this go-round, I had the, the whole Magilla, as it were. That, that play was a one-act play about a fictional meeting between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, so it just dealt with that aspect. I didn't get a chance to really do speeches and things like that but, that I do in this film, so this was a lot more fun. Did playing Malcolm on film have any effect on your life? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, just the things I learned, uh, the things I learned about my own history, my the desire to learn more, going to the pyramids, so to Egypt, you know, on so many levels I've grown. What was the greatest challenge in portraying him? I didn't learn how to lend you. <laughs> I don't know. The greatest challenge? I don't know. Just, it was, a, it was a different challenge every day. I can't say it was one great thing, but every day there was something different. It was, it was, an, it was an education more than a challenge. You know, it really wasn't, it was, it was one of the easiest films I've ever made because I was learning so much. It was like, what can I get to tomorrow? I couldn't wait for the next day. How did you prepare for the role? I did any and everything I could. I got my hands, any, any piece of material I could get my hands on, anybody that I could talk to that, that knew him. Uh, Spike set up a lot of great situations for us to meet his brothers and sisters and children. And, people that were with him on the day he died and people that worked with him at different points in his life and, and, uh, and it attracted those kinds of people as well you know different uh, people who were affected by him you know, affected many people how do you feel audiences will receive the film will they understand the relevance that Malcolm has for today I think so I think that uh, we've done our job that, that they'll see those changes that's our point the, 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 how one can evolve how one one search for truth does evolve and, and, and hopefully they'll walk away with that understanding and, and take a take a look at themselves what was the reaction of people on the street when they found out that you were making Malcolm X I, I really don't know because I really wasn't on the street <laughs> you know uh, People I mean, are being excited. I mean, now that the movie's about to come out, I've never been in a movie that's been more eagerly anticipated. I've never had as many people come up to me uh, in any other movie and say, I can't wait, I just can't wait, you know. So, uh, that day is soon coming. Well, what advice would you give to teenagers watching this film and encountering Malcolm's life and philosophy for the first time? Just to learn your history, to understand where you came from so you'll have a better chance of dealing with where you're going uh, to look for the truth and don't accept anyone's version of it without really checking it out for yourself in your opinion why is it so important that people see this film because it's just it's just timely I, I, it's just the time we're, we're you know, with the election last week and things are changing, there's a, there's a sense of optimism now in the country. and I think this will be a part of that healing process. What do you want people to take away with them after seeing this film? A better understanding of him, a desire to get a better understanding of themselves and how they can help each other, a sense of unity. Malcolm's final message really, in a sense, was we can all live together and we can make it work. That's right. Is it happening? I like to think so. You know, it's surely not focused on as much. You know, I'd like to start a show called Good News, <laughs> you know, because I call what they do now 12 minutes of murder. You know, they're always going to go find who got shot, you know, somewhere somebody had to have gotten killed, so that's all they talk about. And, uh, I like to look on, look at the positive side of things and to think that things are getting better, will get better. And it's nice to know it's in some small way I could possibly be a part of that. You're not an American. You're an African who happens to be an American.
You have to understand the difference. We didn't come over on the, the Nita, the Pinta, and the, and, the, and the whatchamacallit. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. Landed right on top of us. Jordan, is that you, brother? Praise be to Allah. Now, this is exactly what I'm talking about, the slave mentality, the slave mind. This brother and I, we had the slave mind. We used to rob together. We used to sleep with white women. We even went to prison together. Now, don't be surprised when I say we went to prison because some of y'all still in prison right now. Prisons of your mind. Stand up, brother. Come on. <laughs> your brother's a little shy. <laughs> Come on, brother. Give me a hug. Yeah. That's all right, brother. That's all right. Look, he still got his hair fried. That's all right, though. That's the slave mind. Hyatt T. Walker, pastor of Canaan Baptist Church of Christ in Harlem. In the 60s, Reverend Walker was a top aide, not only a top aide, he was the lieutenant, the top lieutenant, uh, chief of staff to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who headed up the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Dr. Walker also knew Malcolm X and also was part of the movie Malcolm. Welcome. Thank you, Bill. Nice to see you again. All right. Uh, you're in the movie, but I understand you have not, as of yet, screened the movie. No, I haven't seen the movie. I've lived the history. You've lived the history. Yeah. All right. Tell us something about that history. I mean, the small role that you have. How did, how did you get the role in this particular movie? Well, as you know, as the uh, struggle against apartheid in South Africa has gained momentum, it has attracted people from disparate quarters of American life and the entertainment world and film people have been involved. And last year, uh, Spike Lee was among those of us who went to Capitol Hill and delivered tens of thousands of petitions to keep sanctions in place. And I had never met Spike Lee, so I just said, you know how shy and retiring I am. I said, Spike, when you need a preacher in your movie, hey, call me. I'd like to be in the movies. Mm -hmm. You know, just making small talk. Right. And uh, I got a call in last December that they had a role for me, but it was not as a minister. And was I interested? I told him, of course, because mm -hmm. I always wanted to be in the movies. Okay. And I went on location in December up near uh, the Audubon Ballroom and have a cameo shot in the film. Hmm. Malcolm X. Now, uh, in the movie, and uh, as in real life, Malcolm X was kind of critical of Dr. King and other so-called moderate civil rights leaders at that time. And uh, you being uh, Dr. King's chief of staff, uh, were they close, and, 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 and how did you feel about that, and what effect did that have on their relationship? Well, by close, I don't know whether you mean were they friends or companions. Uh, they were close very close in terms of their goals and objectives for people of African ancestry. Uh, there was some strain in the days before Malcolm made his pilgrimage to Mecca. And that is because, and we understood it, Malcolm used a great deal of the rhetoric which, rhetoric which is a part of what we call the theater of revolution. If Martin Luther King was in one place, then given the way social movements develop, you would expect to develop a Malcolm X. It was really the focus of an essay that I did on Malcolm uh, for uh, Negro Digest, it was called then, and then became Black World. And John Henry Clark, one of my colleagues and friends, in, was good enough to include it in his anthology. And I took the title from the movie Nothing But a Man, and I went on to show that Malcolm was indeed a, an important historical figure on the American scene but that given a Martin Luther King Jr., you would expect that someone would come with what would be perceived as a more radical approach. Mm -hmm. Now, during that era, uh, what was your impression of Malcolm during that era, during the Civil Rights era, and, and, and the way he was speaking and the type of leadership he projected, as opposed to Dr. King? Well, you're talking about the second Malcolm, I suppose. We're not talking about Big Red. Yes, there, were many, there about, were many yeah, Malcolms. I'm talking about the, about the second the one Malcolm, who became Malcolm the Muslim. Malcolm, who was in the nation, in the nation who of was Islam. committed and loyal to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right. Uh, that Malcolm had a clear and accurate diagnosis of the ills of racism in this land, but in my view, then and now, had no formula as to how to rid ourselves of the problems that afflicted black people. It was mostly, as I said, rhetoric which had to do with the theater of social revolution. But after Malcolm came back from Mecca, uh, the quarter of the black community that he represented and the movement of which we were a part, those two movements came closer together. Uh, they were not identical. Uh, I have, in my own analysis, said that 
Malcolm was an important figure because he represented street people who did not necessarily have any involvement in organized religious life, mm -hmm. whereas D Dr. King was a spokesman for and represented the large numbers of people of African ancestry who were in organized religion. And those two movements moved toward each other. The movement that Dr. King led became more Afrocentric, and uh, the movement that Malcolm led became began to understand the methodology of the nonviolent revolution that Dr. King led. Mm -hmm. Now, did Dr. King ever speak of Malcolm, and what was his opinion of Malcolm, since you were so close to him? Well, he would say, you know, as I say, in the theater of revolution, we have our roles to play. Dr. King recognized that there was a need for a Malcolm X, and in many ways, Malcolm aided and abetted our movement because they had, white America had to take a choice to hear these two towering black figures on the American scene which one shall we choose? Well, certainly at that moment in time, a Martin Luther King who preached and espoused nonviolence was more palatable to white America than a Malcolm X who was perceived as preaching violence, although he never did. Mm -hmm. Malcolm preached self-defense, and uh, uh, the nonviolent credo does not exclude self-defense. There's a point in the nonviolent credo that where there is life and limb at risk, then we are not going to prohibit or take from somebody the right to defend themselves and their family or their loved ones. Do you remember the day that Malcolm was assassinated? Yes, what were you doing I and, what, and what effect did it have on you at the time? Well, I thought it was a profound loss. I was sitting at dinner on 138th Street. I had preached that morning two services at the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And I was sitting at dinner with uh, the late Odell Clark and his wife. And the news came over the radio that Malcolm X had been assassinated that day and uh, this was about 1 or one thirty, as I remember maybe a little early at the Audubon ballroom and uh, I, I had a the recurring feeling that our nation was going mad over the issue of race because you know that was, wasn't uh, John, John Kennedy had been killed and I think it had to do with his turnaround on human rights and of course, Martin Luther King had, was assassinated, so it just looked like we were having these rounds of political assassinations. Mm -hmm. And I, I subscribe to the conspiracy theory. I believe the Kennedys, particularly John, I believe Martin Luther King uh, was a part of a conspiratorial effort to remove him from the American scene. I think the same is true of Malcolm Shabazz. Okay, we'll be back and continue this conversation with Reverend Wyatt T. Walker of the Canaan Baptist Church in Harlem. Don't go away. Just about out of time. I want you to go see the movie, and then you'll come back again, and we will do a critique of it. Be my pleasure. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Bill. And that's our report for this morning. Our quote for the day is from Anna Cummings. Do not save your loving speeches for your friends until they are dead. Do not write them on their tombstones. Speak them rather now instead. I'm Bill McCreary from all of us. Thanks for watching and have a good week. For a transcript of today's McCreary Report, send $5 with date of program to InfoSource, Post Office Box 20049, Greeley Square Station, New York, New York, 10001. Or you may call area code 212-563-8507. The areas of the country where the government has proven itself unable and, uh, or unwilling to defend the Negroes when they are being brutally and unjustly attacked, then the Negroes themselves should take whatever steps necessary to defend themselves. And one of the best methods by which this can be done is to establish rifle clubs. It's legal in this country to own a rifle. This doesn't mean that the Negro is going to initiate some kind of aggressive action among any, uh, against anybody, but it does mean that the Negro will be serving notice that no longer does he believe in turning the other cheek and being the constant victim of someone else's brutality. The, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that the only solution for the problem is that our people, of which there are now 22 million, be uh, involved in a mass exodus back to our own homeland. But this is a long-range program. And, and while we are uh, orienting our mind toward going back in the direction of Africa, we have to live right here. Yes, as I stated earlier, that... Um those nations, African nations, Latin nations, Asian nations, are, are very hypocritical when they stand up in the UN and, and denounce the racism practice in South Africa and at the same time say absolutely nothing about the practice of racism here in American society. Now, I wouldn't be a man if I didn't do so.
I would not be a man. Are you prepared now to work with some of the other leaders of some of the other civil rights organizations? Yes, we're prepared to work with any groups, leaders, organizations, as long as they're genuinely interested in uh, results, Does positive you... results. This edition of the McCreary Report will be rebroadcast Tuesday morning at 1 a.m. Tonight at 8, Damon Wayans is back as Handyman on In Living Color. Then at 8.30, it's Rock Live. That's tonight beginning at 8 on Fox 5.